On this episode of Tips from the Top Floor, we'll look at some futuristic stuff around photography and Colin is planning to do a fun photography project with children. This episode is brought to you by Format.com. Format makes it easy for you to build your fully customizable photography portfolio website without a single line of code. They focus on photographers like you. Simply sell your photography, send photos to your clients for proofing and update your galleries straight from Lightroom. Go to Format.com slash topfloor to start your free 30-day trial. That's Format.com slash topfloor. This is Tips from the Top Floor 818 for Friday, April the 13th, 2018. Tips from the top, from the top floor, tips from the top, all right, from the top floor. Hey, hello and welcome, this is Chris Marquardt, you're listening to Tips from the Top Floor episode uh, 818 for uh, sometime in April and... I'm yeah. You can, <laughs> you might be able to tell that I'm a bit of a bit distracted today, and the reason is simple. I my head is spinning with a gazillion different things that I'm just uh, thing things. I see. I can't even speak anymore with a different. Uh, gaz- Let me try this sentence again. With a gazillion different things that I'm trying to juggle at the same time. I'm proofreading the wide angle book. Uh, the, Eng- the English translation of that. I'm preparing a crazy film photography workshop in Berlin for the weekend, which we call Film Extreme, because we'll do stuff that is kind of outside the mainstream of film photography. We do cross-processing, we'll work with expired film, Uh, we'll use red scale film, we'll have black and white development, push and pull, all the things that go outside the normal use of film, which I'm really looking forward to. The weekend will be... Uh, a bit crazy uh, and one more thing that uh, that I'm doing right now that is uh, making my head spin is I'm shooting some product shots for another book so I got my plate pretty full which is why I thought I would uh, use that opportunity to introduce you to this other little podcast that I do that is also about photography but that is different from tips from the top floor because I recorded with my co-host Adrian and because we have a ton of fun trying to extrapolate and speculate what the what new developments might mean for the future of photography and that is also the title of the show the future of photography now if you're already subscribed to that there might be a bit of duplication here but uh, you can skip forward about 30 minutes to get to the rest of this episode of tips on the top floor because i also answer another listener question here on the show which came in by colin Uh, but if you've never dipped your toes into our little project Here we go with episode 23 of The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Hey, hello and welcome. We're back with another episode. And uh, as usual, your usual team at the microphone. I'm Chris and... And I'm Aid. Hi, folks. So... It's a bit of a special episode because we don't have like one central topic on this one. But uh, as we mentioned in the last episode, episode 22, it is a very fast moving field. Things happen left and right and that generates a lot of follow up stuff that comes in that relates to stuff we did in older episodes. And I thought we'd make this a follow up episode and just look at some new developments. Maybe we should call it new developments, actually, in <laughs> some, some of the areas because, yeah, it's moving. It's moving. It is moving. I, I have to say I'm a little bit nervous about this show because, you know, we, we talk quite freely um, and we talk, uh, and I've mentioned several times in the past, actually, it's nice to be able to predict the future and not have to worry about whether you're right or not. But we haven't had to actually address that yet because <laughs> we're still quite a fresh show. <laughs> so this this is, you know, and, and you think when you make these predictions, you think, oh, yeah, it'll be 12 months. It'll be two years. And by then, everybody will have forgot that I, I talked all that nonsense. <laughs> well, I, I think to our credit, what I usually usual line is, uh, what does that mean for the future photography is mostly speculation and not firm predictions. That's, that's true. I'm, I'm and, trying and to a lot stay of the time away can, from that. Yes, and a lot of the time we do conclude that we don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, but okay, so things happen and uh, I'm going to refer back to a few of the older episodes. Let's uh, kick this off with Skydio R1, the drone that we talked about, the fully autonomous drone that we talked about in episode 19. That and, sounded uh, so impressive. 
Well, it is impressive. And that thing is really impressive. And what I linked to back then was a video from tested.com. They had a yeah, pretty much a, an early test of that thing. Well, it was it is released. You can buy it for two and a half thousand dollars, and it's that fully autonomous drone that that we're using an AI on board and twelve uh, twelve cameras for navigation and for for situational awareness uh, is pretty much hard to crash. It's hard to crash, and they the the test they did back then was. That uh, you, they they ran through a forest and the camera was following the runner and was ducking under twigs and going around tree trunks and stuff without crashing and still with a thirteenth camera which is on a gimbal and it shoots four K uh, still capturing uh, the runner quite quite well and followed that and has different modes. One is the one where the camera stays in front of you. The one is where the camera orbits around you while following you. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting set of problems that that camera has to solve when it works. And the conclusion in episode 19, well, their conclusion that we reported in episode 19 was that this is revolutionary, which I think it still is. Um, but now they have done a much more in-depth test. And again, tested.com. They had that, and they they went out and they played with it a lot more, and then they came come back with a conclusion. It's a pretty uh, long video. Let me check how long it is. I think I haven't had the chance to watch this yet, but I, it's I'm, fifteen I'm, minutes. Think, so that's 15, very long uh, for a YouTube video that tests something. And <clears throat> uh, well, they come they come back with the following conclusions. It's a very very impressive drone it does what it says but it's not perfect so there's still areas where the drone is um yeah can be fooled pretty much and uh, they have a few cases that they demonstrate where they were out somewhere in nature and uh, the, the camera was tracking one of the one of the two and then the other one got in the path between the camera and the, the the tracked person, and then the camera would latch on to another person, to that person now, mm. and uh, then continue tracking that second person. Which well, hey, that still sounds yeah, you know, that still sounds very impressive. At least it didn't start tracking a tree and fly into a cliff or something. It, like it, it didn't do like. that one one time. It 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 lost the it lost the person though, and uh, latched on to another person pushing a, a baby stroller. And then started following that in the in the other direction. <laughs> okay. So, so they had to get the little, phone out. Yeah. They had to get the phone out, start the app, and tell the drone to come back. Um, so then it's a, it's a really hard problem that this thing has to solve. It has to follow that one person, and it, it, I think the way it tracks the person. I think what I remember is that it looks at the clothes mostly, which is those. If you have something bright on the top and something dark on the bottom, it will kind of look at that pattern and try to find that pattern. And right. it might, it, it's easy. I mean, you know, uh, you know that thing where you look at something and you see a face in it while there is no face. Oh, so yes, I'm sure I follow at least one Twitter feed called Faces in Things. <laughs> faces in Things. Uh, the the technical term is pareidolia, and that. Why shouldn't a, an AI-driven camera suffer from the same problem? <laughs> because it does that same thing. It does pattern recognition, and those patterns uh, it can can be fooled. So mm. that that's the one thing they found. It can be fooled most of the time. It works well, but uh, you have to be kind of uh, <laughs> you have to be um, ready to call it back using the app at least a few times. Um, the other thing they found is that yeah, the footage could be a bit more cinematic. You know. And that's, I think, one of the conclusions we had already that with the priority of follow, no, with the first priority of not crashing and the second priority of following that person, the third priority is make it smooth. So mm. it's not it's not the top priority because if it was, the camera would crash more. So making it smooth is only the third priority, which makes perfect sense in the in the context of how it's being used. But it does also mean that uh, the footage is uh, not as smooth as it should be. Sometimes. I would imagine though you could make you could have some workarounds for that. I mean, if you were shooting in a relatively open space where there was less work for the uh, crash avoidance systems right. to do, uh, you know, I, I, I think you could uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, that's that that sounds to me like genuine, but possibly slightly harsh criticism of a oh, first of course, generation of, of a first generation product. This sounds really promising to me. Well, the other thing is, and you know this from shooting video, when you shoot video handheld with a camcorder, with a with a DSLR, with your with your phone, then you you will shoot video, and a lot of it is shaky, and a lot of it is kind of framing things and then you get bumped and then so in the end when you edit you will only use those parts of the video that are smooth and that help you tell the story so you will throw away a lot of the footage especially at the edges of the footage at the beginning and the end of uh, oh yeah filming so uh, of course that footage from that drone is totally perfectly usable because you will as an editor, you will make edit decisions and throw away stuff that is too jerky, for example. Um, another thing they found is that, the, and they shot indoors at a at a basketball court, is that, of course, the camera is doing a lot of things. Uh, the, the drone is doing a lot of things. It's, it's doing obstacle avoidance. It is doing tracking of someone. And, uh, and then if a basketball comes flying towards it, it has a problem handling that one as well so <laughs> i'm sure it does. i think i think i'd have a problem handling a basketball right coming flying towards so me. so of course it's it's kind of um a fast flying object coming towards it so i think they managed to kick it out of the sky a couple of times with a basketball um but that is kind of expected that's a bit harsher as a test as well because in a basketball team everybody wears the same clothes I think they they did a more of a street basketball kind of thing. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Everyone was enough. wearing street clothes, and uh, yeah. But uh, again, of course, this will be more relevant if we look into a potential future where everyone is flying these drones all the time. So the drones will have to be aware of the other drones in the sky, and not crash into those. Anyway, but I think that's a future. I'm not <laughs> sure I want that kind of a future. <laughs> No, no, no. We've talked about that before. It sounds it sounds pretty nasty, doesn't it? So let's hope they invent something else that stops that from needing to be happening. Right. But, so, so I'm really keen. So so if I have to say the uh, the the price is a bit of a barrier to entry for me. Oh, but, of course. Uh, um, the I'm not sure I could justify spending that much money on a drone. I don't have a drone at the moment, and especially not a first generation product. But I can see why it would be very, very interesting to people. So I wish them luck with that, definitely. Yeah. And again, this is the first product out of a possibly a series of products that are only going to improve. In you, you'd, you'd hope so, but uh, but I guess our next update um, is, is an example of where that didn't go quite according to plan. Isn't <laughs> well, okay. It? So going back to episode fifty, next topic, uh, episode fifteen of the future of photography, light field photography, where we talked about uh, Lightro, the company that kind of began making this mainstream or get this into into consumers' hands. And uh, then end of March, twenty first of March, I think the news came out that. Uh, or the rumor came out that Google might be buying Lytro. So that uh, has somewhat materialized. Actually, actually it, another news that preceded that was, um, and that was on March 14th, is that Google had done experiments with light fields. So Google I AR and yeah. VR, what they did is they put a camera array. Just, just imagine a row of GoPros next to each other. And then um, imagine that th- those being on top of each other, forming like a column of GoPros. And now imagine bending that column in an, into an arc. And that thing is on a special system that then can rotate around and take kind of a sweep of, uh, of an environment. And it takes about a minute to do that, and then it creates this light field, and it creates a VR representation of that that you can then kind of dive into with a VR headset and be part of that. And one of the experiments is, I think, in a shuttle or something, or yeah. an airplane, where you can then be kind of in that environment in 3D um, based on that light field, which is one of the uses for that we talked in uh, extensively about this in episode 15 so this was the first thing that came out google experimenting with that shortly followed by the rumor that google might be buying lytro for just something between 25 and 40 million dollars which doesn't sound too much 
And finally, uh, just a few days ago before we're recording this um, end of March, Lytro is officially closing down. Yeah, so. this is a, this is a real shame. Um, I, I I really hope that they they'd be able to do something. Well, I mean, it, it's it's interesting though. It's it, it's is it really niche this stuff? I don't know. I think at the moment it's niche. And you read these uh, these Google experiments. Um, Google, of course, at this point very well known for experimenting and also oh, we're having a with, lot of money to do we're having a lot of money well. but also but also quite um quite a reputation for um shutting things down if they're not working um and <laughs> yes. and i know things that i know things that um uh, i know that there are products that they've closed down uh, where people where, where some of the users have been quite uh, you know um uh, quite emotional about that but but broadly speaking they 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 shut down the right things i think i've observed over the last 10 years or so but the f- from a distance of course but the uh, the the use of the light fields from that article that google posted about their experiment it seems that it's going to be the the use of the light field technology in a virtual reality setting um it, it seems to be they they think they can um, better represent the experience of how things move in your field of vision uh, at a distance uh, versus the uh, the close-up thing so a sort of parallax kind of uh, thing and making that more realistic but that seems to me to be incredibly niche Um, you know vr i've I've tried a bit of vr i I could take it or leave it to be honest (laughs) And I think that's what a lot of people have experienced with VR mm. to date. Um, and so I, I'd be intri- I hope they take this forward, and I hope it's good. And I, it's a shame Lytro didn't succeed. I thought when they released the uh, uh, the Ilum p- product um, that that might be them getting towards mainstream availability of of high quality products, but sadly mm. it was never picked up by the market. Well, for for whichever reasons we have, I think uh, talked about this in our previous episode. But um, the, the 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 interestingly enough that we have no no real official confirmation yet. If really, if Google bought them, they've just shuttered. It's a very um, uh, it's a rumor, and I think it's it's quite substantiated. But um, the way it looks as well, the, 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 some 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 companies reported, like Verge, for example, reported that a large fraction of Lightroom's employees will be joining Google. So I think it's pretty clear. It sounds a bit like an acqui hire, you know, where they uh, acquire new talent for their own yeah. purposes. Mm. Uh, also, some of the Lightroom assets will be uh, become part of Google, as in patents and things. So uh, it, it could be, it could well be that. Lytro is, is completely shutting down its own products and uh, technology and people will become part of Google. I think we'll find out. Um, uh, Petapixel writes, what Lytro's demise means for the future of consumer light field cameras remains to be seen. Okay, so in the they, short term, though, it's probably fair to say there'll be fewer consumer grade light field cameras. Well, uh, Lightroom went completely industrial anyway a while ago without uh, we're completely leaving the consumer market. So mm. let's find let's 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 wait. Well, let's wait this out. Um, okay, next topic, episode eleven. Remember our unsupervised image to image translation networks episode. That was the one where some researchers did, uh, well, came up with algorithms where they could take photos from like a summer setting and turn them into winter photos. Uh, yes, by, I by do. And, that, and, and they were even starting to do it with video as well, weren't they? And, and uh, they did video as well, but it had, it had artifacts and things. Uh, along those lines comes uh, fast photo style, which is a new AI algorithm that is now has been released or published or whatever by NVIDIA. These are the guys who used to be mainly graphics cards, but now have a lot of AI processing going on on their GPUs. And, and, they, uh, and they were behind the technology we talked about in that earlier show as well, weren't they? Right, and they are also behind, like um, I think NVIDIA is also inside Tesla's to help with the... Uh, with the autopilot AI and things like that. So um, NVIDIA and the University of California Merced have uh, come up with a seemingly new algorithm 
uh, where they do something similar. They call this fast photo style, which is uh, transferring one photo's style to another. So they have some examples there where you have like a... I don't know, uh, an, a building on a on a, a black and white photo of an old building and a color photo of new buildings. And then they make this old building photo look like it was a new photo in the same style of the other photo or t turning day into night photos or turning uh, summer photos into winter photos. So they're doing something similar there. But they claim it's a new algorithm. It's faster. They uh, claim it is um, split splitting up the task into separate steps they have a style stylization step where the style of a reference photo will be transferred to the content photo and then there's a smoothing step that helps make things photorealistic by um, and i'm quoting encouraging spatially consistent stylations uh, <laughs> that stylizations, stylizations that sounds lovely but i have no idea what it means but I'm not sure there's really. a lot of look at the look at the website there's also a paper um that you can read like a scientific paper with a uh, lots of formulas in it. So that scared me quite a bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, my maths wouldn't be up to that either. But but now that I did looking at this, it it's um it it's it's really interesting. It continues to be really interesting. Um and it sounds like this is almost, you know, uh if an algorithm is a product, this is almost the second generation product along this uh, along this stream, isn't it? Um it, it and, and if they can make things, you know, an order of magnitude faster, which is what they're saying they can. That's um, their, that's one of their claims that they, that their algorithm is like uh, 60 times faster than the state of the art method at this point. Okay. That, that, that's quite something. And know? so, um, so, so we are, we're looking at this potentially becoming real time. So you, you don't have to put, put the, put the, put your photos or video into an algorithm, wait for however long and then get them out. But you could, possibly do this in real time yeah so do you know what this this is this appeals to the lazy photographer in me you know um uh, because i can go out in the middle of the day and take a lovely landscape shot get home put it on my computer and turn it into a sunrise <laughs> exactly <laughs> and if, that's and if, so, and if somebody can just uh, uh, have uh, uh, an ad mist ad, ad dawn mist algorithm then then i'll be done thanks <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so um, one thing I would like you to click on, it's kind of along those lines, there's a link uh, to, uh, again, if we talked about this in episode 11, it's still about this image to image translation, and uh, someone is doing visual poetry using real time image translation framework. So there is real time there. And someone is turning this into art. There's this guy. Um, <clears throat> who, okay, so um, I am look, I've clicked on the link. Okay. Wow. Okay. Just start that first video on that web page, and you will you will see what what he's doing. Just watch it. Uh, turn down the sound and just watch the, okay. watch the pictures. So you have a before and after picture, and um, what what that guy does is he uses a, a, a one of these image translation networks that he trained on something. So in that case, he trained one on a video of the sea. So you have the sky, you have the sea. In the, in the AI network. And then he uses some other video where he uses some cloth that he moves on a table and the translation makes this into a rough sea and a sky above it. Wow, it does, so, yeah. So he's, he's making this into art. And if you forward a bit in the network, he has like a, a I don't know, a charger of like a, like a phone charger, the black phone charger that he puts on top of that cloth and then that turns into a rock in the, in the remaining, in, into the resulting image. Or he trained a network on uh, being able to, to translate something into fire. So he all of a sudden has fiery hands and he, he's, it's pretty, uh, pretty artsy kind of thing. But um, if you go to about the two minute mark, you can see that uh, he's, he uses a network that is trained on flowers. So yeah. just just with the hands in front of the camera, that is. Oh, and by the way, looking at that hand, it could be that I'm talking about a she. I didn't even look at the name. <laughs> I assumed it was a guy. That was very bad of me. But um, so you see the hand moving in the in the original video, and next to it you see the, the you see flowers appearing out of seemingly nothing, and it's. It's really beautiful. And and do we know if this is happening in 
in, in real, real time. time. This is happening in real time. So that, that, that is astonishing, and it, it looks great. And when some of the items are left to be slightly um, uh, left to be stationary in the image frame, so the phone charger or the car key, um, then the the uh, the algorithm is creating something that looks uh, very very much like flowers. Um, uh, when they're moving slightly less so, but still very interesting art. The the one with the sea was in- really interesting. So, yeah, you know, uh, with having what looked to be a, a, a light, br- a simple piece of light blue cloth on a table representing the sky and then a standard yellow duster representing <laughs> <Yes>. the sea. <laughs> You know, um, uh, you know, moving those around and in real time that's being created into, uh, do you know what the aesthetic reminds me of? Uh-huh. Um, do you know the, uh, the movie of the snowman? Yes, yes, yes. Oh yes. The, of the, si- the silent movie of the snowman, the, uh, which is, I guess you could, uh, it's animation with colored pencils or that, at least that's what it's always. I, like I think I, I know that, that one. Yes. Uh, Raymond, what was his name? Ray- Raymond, uh, Raymond Briggs. I think was that Raymond Briggs. May have been anyway, um, but it's it's that kind of uh, slightly jittery but very artistic animation that it, that this algorithm has been tuned to provide. That's that's awesome. I like that a lot. Oh, by the way, I was right in assuming it was a guy, and I think now now I remember because on his info page he says uh, his name is Memo Atkin, and he is uh, from Istanbul, currently based in Sussex, UK, and uh, there's a photo of him. So oh, yeah, right. just just so, down the road from me, then Sussex, not too far. Anyway, so th- that's the art, the art aspects of image to image. I, I, I find this really interesting because it really shows that we're not only looking at uh, a future where that technology will make photography better, but there is completely new art forms emerging, and that is, I think, just wonderful. Absolutely. One more thing. I have wow. one more thing that just recently came up and it has to do with an ad. And uh, we look into the future of photography and we look often look into, well, using computers and AI to artificially generate stuff. And um, one thing that uh, just a short while ago came out is an ad by Apple for their HomePod, this, their new s- cylinder that you talk to. And... Um, they have this. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen this ad where they uh, there's this this woman. I think it's in a small apartment. She is very tired, but then she 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 lies down on her sofa and then starts to dream. And all of a sudden, the apartment changes, and you can see like uh, she, she and she's a dancer. So she now has the music playing from the home pod and she starts to dance and she starts to push walls to the side and the whole apartment stretches out. So you see um it looks very digital, you know, it, it looks very CGI. She, she's pushing the wall and all of a sudden there's a corridor and the lights are stretched out. And if you, if you go to the link that I pasted there, you can see this in the bottom frame pretty much. Uh, it's, it's like, like, it looks like digital artifacts and it's very, very, uh, I, I think it's a cool video. It's a beautiful kind of thing. And she makes this apartment into like a stage. And then in the end, she falls back down on her sofa and she's back to her small apartment. But she made this, the music and so it's a, it's a very kind of touching story. Um, and the video, I looked at that, I watched that for the first time and was really kind of, well, wow, that's a, good piece of work and they had they hired spike jones to do this for them so they have that name connected to it and uh what just recently emerged is a behind the scenes video where you can see how they did all this and interestingly enough is that almost everything in the video is practical effects so they built an apartment on a stage that has hydraulics and mechanics behind it and people pushing levers and pulling levers to stretch things out to move things, to make this. So this is entire, almost the entire thing, apart from a few areas, is not CGI. It's real practical effects. And I think a lot of that is still being done practically because it has a different feeling to it. It has a different aesthetic to it. So I think I, I think it's important to remember that the, the future of photography is not just about computational stuff. No, I mean, it's you, not. 
you know, it's uh, when, when we were talking in the last show about extracting f- photos from videos, and you, you very kindly acknowledged that sometimes the, the photographer has a, 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 a part to play and that you have to choose <laughs> what to point the camera at. <laughs> it's still pretty much mainly the case. And and I think, but it, but it's true. I mean, I I've recently um, I recently got uh, a new instant f- uh, camera, instant fo- photography camera. So this is uh, it shoots uh, the square Fuji Instax film. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually a lomography camera, so it's it's not the the uh, part digital, part analog one that Fuji make. It's actually a purely analog camera. So you put your pack of film in the back of it and you shoot instant photography so it's Um, all analog it's all analog and it's brilliant and (laughs) and i you know and uh they're they're definitely the the, there definitely is uh, a progress that's being made in in analog photography you know we've seen the the relaunch of some films recently last year lots and lots of new films were, were were released uh, uh, but we're seeing new cameras coming through as well. Um, and, you know, not obviously at the rate of digital stuff and, and not at the rate of computational stuff with the iteration speeds of, you know, mobile phones and stuff like that, but it's still there. And it's quite heartening to see that people are still actually building things in the real world and, and, uh, and using those to make their, their effects rather than just, uh, using CGI. So yeah, it's good. I like that. So Very the future, indeed. the future of photography is analog people remember that <laughs> <laughs> the future of the photography is whatever anybody wants it to be this is the thing. so you you and i both sit in this position where we have we have this show you, you you have others and we both also do analog photography shows and uh so so we we exist both of us exist in both worlds in a sense don't we or at the uh, sort of opposite ends of the spectrum yes we and do. so it, it's nice when you see uh the uh that the, the analog world is is still alive and kicking. Um, yeah, recently at the photography show uh, in Birmingham in the UK, uh, two of the bi- the busiest stands were the Fuji Instax stand and the Lomography stand. Yeah, there's huge communities building up around those, and and every year they they're bigger and they have more stuff. So uh, yeah, it's 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 good. The few, so I think the few- we can we can conclude that technology is not everything. No, no, there's still some place for creativity. Uh, yeah, st- and for there's still a place yeah. in the creativity chain for humans. <laughs> so. All right. So I think with that, we'll wrap up this follow-up episode. I hope it was... Okay, wait, well, hold on, hold on. Don't zap to the next podcast just yet. Tips from the top floor 818 is not over yet. After the break, we'll hear from Colin about a cool photo project that he's planning to do with kids. <laughs> Let me take a minute to talk about a new sponsor, Format.com. Format makes it easy to build your own professional portfolio website without a single line of code. Now, I know you're wondering, how is Format different from the other guys? Well, it's simple. They focus on you, on visual artists, on designers, illustrators, and of course, on photographers. It's essential these days to present your portfolio online and in style, and Format makes that easy and beautiful. Their themes look fantastic. I especially love their aura theme. It's just so clear and stylish, and it presents your photography in a really clean and pleasing way. And if you're planning to sell your photography, you can set up an online store in Format within minutes. They won't even charge a commission on store sales. Don't take my word for it. Give Format a try for free. Each plan includes your free per personal domain, um, what I really like, you can update your online portfolio directly from Lightroom. No more exporting your photos and then trying to find them on your hard drive and then uploading them through a clunky website. No more of that. Just imagine how much time you could save by doing all that straight from Lightroom. They even feature built-in security, protect your photos with passwords and custom watermarks. And all that is just scratching the surface. There's more, including a client-proofing workflow to allow you to get sign-off on your photos by your clients, a built-in blogging platform, and their iPhone app to manage your galleries. And if you have questions, they located their 24-7 support around the world, so you can always get one of their experts to help you. Now, here's a special deal for you. You can try out Format for free for 30 days without a credit card. All you'll have to do is go to format.com slash top floor to find out more. That's format.com slash top floor, format.com slash top floor. This episode is also brought to you by WeTransfer. 
And I'm not just saying that, I actually use their service regularly to share big files around the world for free. They're all about making the creative process easier for everyone. There's no sign-in, no offer codes, no password to forget. Just upload, send and get back to making what you make. 40 million people use WeTransfer to send and receive files every month and since day one they've devoted 30% of their ad space to showcasing creative people from around the world, from musicians to illustrators to photographers to podcasters like me. So in that spirit, I'm skipping the rest of this 60 second ad and get right back into the podcast. Hello, Chris. My name's Colin. I'm a photographer from Scotland. I've been asked to teach uh, six, 11 and 12 year olds a little about photography. I thought I'd start with some analog work. I'm going to start with a uh, photo paper with things on top of it and sunlight exposure but was thinking about getting them to build their own pinhole camera. I was looking to find out if you could recommend any online resource with designs for simple pinhole cameras that I could get them to build themselves. Anyway, thank you very much and keep up the good work with the podcast. <laughs> Wonderful, Colin. I love this. Making pinhole cameras with kids is just an awesome, amazing thing. I remember the sense of wonder and, and excitement that 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 instilled into me back when I was younger. So the first step would probably be cyanotype, as you said, like uh, just pretty much the blueprint process as we know it. It's easy to use to use that to capture shadows of things that you um, lay on top of that blueprint paper and have the sun shine on it for a few minutes and then the shadows uh, get, the whole thing gets developed um, very, very simply by holding it under running water, cold running water, and then dry it and you're done. So and you can buy that ready-made, ready-made cyanotype paper. This is the name of it. Um, it comes in black bags and you can just use it straight from the bag. Or you get the chemicals, which is two, two liquids that you have to mix and then in a, in a not-so-bright environment paint on paper with a brush. And you can have the kids make their own cyanotype paper this way. And uh, you can even make cyanotype out of almost anything like t-shirts for example so that would be a cool thing for the kids to take home uh, now the next step up would be to make pinhole cameras and use some proper film in them now i <laughs> if it was me i would probably use a large format sheet film and develop it myself and build a box and stuff but i was thinking how to make this as convenient as possible for you so the kids could do it uh, could do it easily and uh, would be a bit more budget friendly and uh, especially when you have a lot lots of kids in the class uh, and I remembered the project where where years ago I built a matchbox pinhole camera now here's a quick rundown of what you need to do this uh, first of all you'll need an empty matchbox a pair of scissors a piece of aluminum foil aluminium foil, we're in Europe here, a needle, a couple of rolls of cheap color negative film and a black duct tape that doesn't let any light through. That's pretty much all you need. And what you'll do is you take the drawer out of the matchbox, you cut a hole in it, a rectangular hole, and put that back inside the matchbox and you slip the beginning of the film uh, from that roll between the matchbox and the drawer. So it's a little film stage. And then on the opposite side of the drawer, on the, in the outside box, you cut a hole and you cover that with aluminum, al aluminum, 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 with aluminum foil that that you poked a tiny pinhole into, with a pin. And and what? Uh, and, and and then then you want an empty film canister on the receiving end of the spool, um, kind of to spool the film into. And then you cover everything up with the black tape to make sure to, your film can only get light through that pinhole. And then you can even like you can craft a little manual shutter mechanism with some sliding cardboard in front of the pinhole, with the long. We, you, we were talking longer exposure times. So we were talking one, two, five, ten seconds. So um, that's an easy thing with a, a piece of sliding paper. And there is actually a website that describes that in more detail, and that's matchboxpinhole.com. Who would have thought? And it's, it's it, for me personally, that's like a two hours on a Sunday afternoon project. Um, so you could do this with the kids uh, easily in a day and take the photos. Now, the, the reason why this is so amazing is because it has so many advantages to 
uh, to itself. The, first of all, the ingredients will be easy to find. You won't really have to go hunting or go, going to obscure websites to buy stuff. Matchboxes are easy to come by. Uh, the film is still easy to get. Um, then color negative film is incredibly forgiving when it comes to exposure. And as the exposure times are going to be anywhere between like 1 and 10 seconds, depending on the light conditions, that should make it so easy for the kids to handle. They can even learn how to estimate time in their minds. So, uh, yeah. And and then many drugstores will still allow you to drop off color negative film for development. And if you're lucky, if you live in a bigger city, you might even find a one-hour lab around the corner and they can develop and print those pictures for you right there. So I think making a pinhole camera is probably a, one of the most rewarding projects you can do with kids because, I mean, depending on the age of the kids, you could even, like, if they're too young, you could prepare a few things like cutting the holes into the matchbox drawers or make the pinholes. You can, you can do this with kids at many different ages. And one thing's for sure, this will leave a lasting impression on all of them because uh, they will get to keep their own photos as prints and that is worth a lot. A print in your hand is magic. All right, that was it for this episode of Tips from the Top Floor. Thanks, everyone, for your support. And thanks to my sponsors, Format.com and WeTransfer, for supporting the show. Also, don't forget to send in your voicemails. I love getting your questions and your feedback and your tips. Send them to voice at tfttf.com. And, oh, uh, I'm still looking into starting that little regular segment here on the show with listener-provided photo tips. So if you have a photo tip, something, something you do, some technique or some trick that you think might be of value for other listeners of this show, send it my way to voice at tfttf.com. That's voice at tfttf.com. Dot com. Music for the show by Jeff Smith, Silent Partner and Headspot Cargo Publishing, and Slack Challenges by Release Pixie Matt, Raf Sitar, Armstead, Slack Invitations by Chief Invitation Officer, CIO Rusty Russ. I remember that. My name is Chris Marquardt. Follow me on Twitter at Chris Marquardt, Chris M A R Q U A R D T. And of course, go out and take amazing photos, be nice to each other. I'm off to do some more head spinning things now. And happy shooting. <laughs> <laughs>